Hello. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont Superior Court judge. This is the Judge Ben Show. It's one in a series of interviews that I do with people about legal issues in Vermont. Today, my guest is Kara Casey, who uh, works with the Vermont Network um, Against Domestic Violence and Sex Assault. And we're going to talk about housing as a necessary part of uh, support for victims. Um, I've just got to interject this, that very recently there was an article in the New York Times. The headline was, UK Review says justice system failed thousands of victims of sexual assault. And the article went on to say some just amazing things that of the, in the year that was studied, hundred there were an estimated victims of uh, sexual violence of 128,000 victims in the year. But that only dealt with adult victims. It didn't de did deal with child victims. So there probably were more cases than that. 50% um, <laughs> of those victims withdrew from the investigations that were started by the police. And ultimately, only 1.6% uh, of the reported case cases led to a criminal charge against the perpetrator. Um, <clears throat> amazing. Uh, the report stated that the government should work for a cultural change in police and prosecutors and try to avoid undermining the credibility of victims. Uh, I guess it was, it was startling to me to think it was that bad, but it made me feel grateful for people like Kara and what we're doing in Vermont to try to cope with these very serious problems. Uh, my guest today is Kara Casey. Kara, what is your official title? My official title is Director of Economic Empowerment. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> very impressive. Um, let's see. Um, I guess uh, I guess what I wanted to say to you was, it seems to me that you're providing a lot of services. And I know that you were kind enough to kind of put together a, kind of a, a, a statistical accounting for what, what's been going on with the Vermont Network Against uh, Domestic Violence. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how many people uh, received um, support from the network in the last year? Sure. Um, we have about, about 7,800 people receive support from our member organizations in 2020. And out of those, um, with, with housing support specifically, it was uh, 3,629 people received advocacy and support related to housing specifically. Wow. Okay, and uh, how many people were actually provided with shelter? Yeah, um, so 400 people stayed in shelter and that was for over 31,000 um, nights. Wow. Um, was that just an adult or were there child victims as well? There was also uh, children. So 169 of those 400 were children. And out of that number, 97 were aged zero to six. Wow. And how many people were put up in motels and for how many nights? Yeah, we um, had about 826 people staying in motels uh, for over 34,000 bed nights. Um, and that included 251 children and out of that, 135 were um, zero to six years old. And you, you put some people into a transitional housing? Yes, some of our member organizations provide transitional housing and uh, 90 people access transitional housing and um, 49 were children. I guess I should say, could you tell me what the member organizations are? Um, yeah. How so many are there? We have 15 uh, member organizations and they, they serve every single county, every town in Vermont. Well, <clears throat> um, I, my impression has always been that the people are, the victims of domestic violence and sex assault are very reluctant to complain for several reasons. Not the least of which is they don't have any place else to go. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we're, we're in a situation in which they feel stuck and they can sometimes persist in being physically abused uh, for years uh, because they don't have an alternative. 
Is that is that something that you're trying to address? Absolutely. So um, we know that domestic violence is one of the leading causes of homelessness in the U.S. Uh, for women and children, and it's it's pretty similar in Vermont. Historically, we've seen that uh, it's one of the the top reasons that uh, people are experiencing homelessness, and um, people are often faced with that situation of, do I stay in an unsafe situation um, or do I leave that situation knowing that what is on the other side is potentially um, not having a home? So it's a, it's a really very difficult position for someone to be in um, to choose between you know, their safety um, or potentially homelessness. Well, what is the average uh, stay for someone who comes into shelter in Vermont? So last year, the average for um, our domestic and sexual violence shelters was 77 days. Um, and so when people think of shelter, they typically think of an emergency situation, right? Like where you just kind of need a place to land and then you can you know, move on to, to more permanent situation. And what we're finding uh, throughout the years, I think both both in the domestic and sexual violence shelters, but also just statewide in the emergency shelters, is that people are really needing a longer uh, period of time in those shelters because they're unable to find um, safe, stable, affordable housing uh, in in a reasonable amount of time. And is the Vermont legislature trying to do anything to help with this? Yeah. So um, this year because of, I think partially because of what's happening right now with, with homelessness and the large amount of people staying in, in motels right now, um, and partially because of the influx of federal funding, the legislature was really able to um, create an, a historic influx of, of housing funding in their budget. Um, so they put in $190 million this year for, for housing um, that includes expanding emergency shelter, but it also includes building more, more housing um, and particularly affordable housing. And so that's, that's not something that we're gonna see you know, right away, but before the end of the year, I anticipate we're gonna start seeing some more of those units come online. And, and we really have experienced, especially this year where um, there is more federal funding to kind of support people in housing. So, you know, rental assistance and that type of thing. Um, we've experienced that now we just have, we need the units for people to be able to move into. So even with that support, uh, that financial assistance, um, people are, are still main, remaining in shelters or in motels because they actually don't physically have like housing to move into. So think, this is going to be think, historic. I think I read somewhere that they're going to build a 21 unit uh, a building to hold people who are escaping from domestic violence. Is that right? Yes. So that's um, Steps to End Domestic Violence is one of our member organizations. And they, um, this past year, uh, it's already complete and we already, they already have folks staying there, um, uh, constructed a, a new, or I guess renovated a new 21 unit shelter. Um, and that was in partnership with a Champlain Housing Trust. Um, so that's up in Chittenden County. And um, what's unique about that is that number one, that was that, that partnership that they created with the Housing Authority to be able to, um, I mean the Housing Trust to be able to renovate an old motel um, and, and really um, transform those rooms into their own units. So people have their own bathrooms, their own um, space to cook in. Um, so it's a really you know unique model, um, and it's it's already um, already filled up. So we know that the need is greater uh, than that. But that was a really great opportunity that they seized to have that collaboration and build that new shelter. And what percentage of the people who are homeless in Vermont are survivors of domestic violence and sex assault? Do you know? Um, so in the past. Um, the past year's point in time count, which is where we count like all of the folks that are in in shelter in Vermont, it was seven percent. Um, 
that is actually lower than it has been in previous years. And I think that the reason that is, um, is because in previous years, pre-pandemic people, um, one of the uh, things that could make people eligible for emergency motel stays was that they were fleeing domestic violence um, or sexual violence. And this year um, they kind of opened that up. So a lot of people that maybe were fleeing um, did not have to kind of um, certify that or you know, say I'm fleeing domestic violence. They just needed to say I'm homeless. I don't have a place to stay. Oh. Um, so in previous years, that percentage um, on that point in time count was, I, I think it was maybe 16% last year. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a significant percent. And it, is there anything that can be done for people who live in rural areas? I assume it's easier in Burlington or someplace in Chittenden County to access alternate housing. But if you live out, way out in the country, it must be more difficult. Is that, is that correct? It is, yes, that is correct. Um, you know, in a rural state like Vermont, not having access to transportation or other ways of connecting with people, um, such as internet, you know, telephone, um, having your neighbors close by, those are all things that we struggle with in Vermont. Um, and we know that isolation is a power um, and control tactic that's often used against victims. So the fact that we live in a rural area just really um, kind of compounds that. And um, so that does mean that there's, you know, can mean lack of connection to resources, um, you know, that lack of connection to a person that you could potentially tell, um, you know, this is, I've experienced this, or this is what I'm experiencing to reach out to for help, um, including family and friends. Um, you know, I think that some of the investments that um, are being made now in broadband could potentially um, be helpful for that, especially people that have, um, you know, have, haven't had that power and control tactic used with like electronics or people that are out of an abusive situation that can reach out over, over the internet. Um, I think that there's been some innovative things that have been done this year to connect with survivors um, more digitally because advocates haven't been able to connect um, in person. Um, and I, I think that those, some of those are here to stay, um, but we definitely could always do more in helping to um, really provide resources where people are at um, and you know, creating more transportation infrastructure, that type of thing. And those aren't things that you usually think of when people think of how can we support survivors of domestic and sexual violence, right? But, um, but things like investment in transportation um, and, and internet connectivity, those, those are really important. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I know how difficult transportation is in rural area. You know, I live in a rural area and we have, a, we have a, an organization in the islands where I live that we help to provide transportation for people who don't have it. Yep to take them to doctor's appointments and other things. Um, but it's, it's, it's tough, it really is tough. I mean, yeah. I, I know there are any number of women who've been violated who just feel lost because there's, there's no place to go. And particularly if they have children, you know, it's not like they can just jump up and run out, you know, uh, to mm -hmm. a family member or a friend nearby. It's right. really difficult, it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, um, what are your, you, you, you've mentioned uh, partners in uh, county organizations and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, are, they, are, they, are they like member organizations of the network violent, of the network that you work for? Um, so we have, yeah, we have our 15 member organizations um, throughout the state and they're, they're part of our coalition. Um, and we you know, provide training, technical support to them and they uh, help to inform a lot of the work that we do um, in that connection with survivors. Um, and then they each have networks that they work with um, locally in order to provide uh, the support that survivors need. So connecting them to, um, connecting them to housing, connecting them to, um, to healthcare, uh, applications to uh, three squares Vermont uh, transportation, that type of thing. So 
um, although we have 15 member organizations that are part of our network, uh, there's really so many more people and so many more organizations in the state that are that are helping to support survivors in various ways and connecting with our member organizations to do a lot of that. My, my experience in the past has been that a lot of people just kind of are kind of lost in this, particularly those, frankly, who don't have a computer at home and don't have internet access. Yeah. Um, what, what's, how can someone, you know, if, if you know of someone you're trying to help, how would you, what would you suggest they do to try to get support? How would they contact someone? Yeah, so if they um, so if they do have internet access, they can connect on our website at www.vtnetwork.org, and they can look up specifically what um, what organization works in your area. Um, and if not, they can connect with our hotline number. Let me see if I have it somewhere. Um, I can get that for you in a second. But, but we we do have a, a hotline number. Um, that you can also call and then be connected to one of our member organizations. Um, and, and it doesn't just have to, it doesn't have to be, yeah, somebody experiencing um, sexual or domestic violence themselves. It can be somebody that is um, concerned for a friend or a neighbor or um, a child that they work with at school. So it can, um, it can be just somebody reaching out for how do I help this person in my life or um, how do I be a better friend to my friend that has experienced this. Um, and so the domestic violence hotline number is 1-800-228-7395. And then there's a sexual violence hot number, hotline number as well. And that's 1-800-489. 7273. And if you don't know who your local member organization is, you can connect there and they'll send you um, to the right place. That's great. You know, I, I apologize to you. I, I didn't ask you to have that all lined up and you did it okay. at the drop of a hat. So that was very impressive. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, no problem. Okay, Kara, is there anything else you'd like to say about this subject? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would say that if people are, are interested in, in helping and if people are interested in the subject, um, reach out to your local member organization and see what type of support they need. It could be volunteering, it could be donating. Um, if you're a landlord or, uh, or somebody that works at a housing organization and you're not connected to one of your member organizations, um, reach out to them if you're um, you know, interested in providing affordable, safe housing for someone. Um, you know, these are all things that we can do in our community to help make it safer. Um, so I really encourage folks to reach out. Kara, that's great. That really is great. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very impressed with what you're doing and I thank you very much. I think yeah. this, this is a great public service. I've dealt with a lot of, in, on the bench and as an attorney, I've dealt with many of these cases and it's, uh, there's sometimes when it's just heartbreaking to see what people have to live with, particularly the uh, particularly the young children who see uh, one parent battering the other. It's, it's mm -hmm. such a dreadful way to grow up. So someone who can provide alternate housing like yourself, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, have a good day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.